Let's see. So we're going to go in alphabetical order. So Emily, if you wouldn't mind starting, we would love to just hear what brought you to your specific specialty and what your career journey has been like. Please take us away. Sure. Hi, my name's Emily. Um, I was, I did the four-year program at Georgetown. I just graduated in 2019, so I'm fresh on the job. Um, I work as a NICU nurse at Children's. So if you don't know what that stands for, it's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. So it's all babies. Um, I got to where I am because um, I did my first peds rotation with school at Children's. I was on 7 East. And at that point, I knew I definitely wanted to work with kids because I loved it so much compared to adult world. And then that summer between my junior and senior year, I did a nurse externship at Children's and um, my summer job, I did partly nursing research with the um, quality part of nursing. And then I did part um, like clinical experience on the cardiac ICU. And that's how I realized I want to do ICU stuff. And then finally, my senior practicum, I was placed on the children's NICU. And it kind of clicked that I really loved babies and I really liked the ICU setting there. So on my last day of practicum, I just kind of checked in with the nurse educators and told them I was interested in applying. And it kind of worked out from there. Thank you, Emily. So I'm not sure that Mary is in yet. So Don, could you share with you, how did you get to your specialty? Tell us what brought you there. Sure. Hi, I'm Dawn. I'm a nurse anesthetist um, or CRNA is what they also call a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Um, my journey started uh, 14 years ago when I started nursing school. Um, I originally thought I wanted to be a pediatrician. So kind of coming off of the peds topic. Um, I interviewed a pediatrician as a senior in high school and she was very, very honest with me, which I was thankful for. Um, talking about family life balance. And I decided I would instead become a nurse practitioner. So I went to nursing school and um, focused on pediatrics for a while. And then I was in the operating room uh, for a pediatric tonsil procedure. And I about passed out on the floor. I was like, this is not for me. Um, this is making me really nervous. And I looked all around the room to try to find something to distract myself with. And I found the person standing at the head of the bed who was an anesthesiologist. He kind of took me under his wing and he taught me all kinds of cool stuff. And I was just so interested in what was going on and the fact that a gas was keeping this patient asleep so they didn't feel anything. Um, so I was just super interested and he kind of led me in the right direction talking to me about what did I needed to do to get there, including focusing my nursing education on critical care. So I did that and I started as an ICU nurse um, in Newport News, Virginia for about two years uh, before I applied to anesthesia school at Georgetown and was accepted. And I graduated from anesthesia school in December of 2010. Um, so I started in 2011 and just passed 10 years of practice as a CRNA and I love every minute of it. Me, my turn. Sorry if my cat interrupts. He's very needy. I just got home from work. Um, my name is Angelica Ferrazzi. So I graduated from Boston College in 2013, came down and did the new grad nurse residency program at Georgetown in 2013. And I was on a med search floor and I actually stayed for the entirety of my bedside career, which was actually up until a week ago, which is like very, um, was very bittersweet for me. Um, I, but med search is is and was my passion. I thought it was the greatest bedside experience that I definitely could have had. And not everyone agrees with me, but I know a lot of people say, get your start in med surge. Um, but I definitely do firmly believe in that. I learned more in these past eight years than I could have ever imagined. And so um, when I was two years in, and you should wait at least a year or two before you start grad school, um, I started my DNP in adult gerontological primary care Unlike the babies, I love the older adults. Um, they're just adorable to me. But um, so the geriatric population is my preferred population, but my um, scope of practice is ages 12 and up. 
So I just didn't want to deal with negative nine months through age 12. Um, and so if, after COVID graduating, I finally found an NP job within MedStar that I wanted. And unfortunately, I had to leave Georgetown, which makes me very sad. But there's a brand new oncology clinic at MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital. So now all of a sudden, I'm an oncology nurse practitioner. And today is day three. I just like really jumped in. Uh, I think I need to not come in so hot because I came in a little hot, but I'm just really excited to um, like make some changes, like coming from Georgetown down to a small community hospital. Um, I feel like I have a lot of experience under my belt that I can, and, and with the DMP, you know, I got it because I wanted to implement practice change. I wanted to improve practice. So I feel like I'm really going to try and do that. So med surge, geriatrics, and I guess now oncology. So I work with a couple of infusion nurses who are awesome. I don't, I don't know if we have an oncology person here, but I started working with them and they're incredible too. So that's me. Is Mary here? Did she get in yet? Oh yeah, she's down there. So that's my, that's my best friend, Mary, <laughs> in her wedding. Um, I'll just I'll let her do the talking. She's um, the greatest midwife I know and is on call right now, just like in the middle of delivering babies. So she, uh, go ahead, Mary. Hi, I am a midwife, um, as Angelica said, a nurse midwife, um, uh, which is why I'm all geared up. I'm here on call. I'm working outside the hospital in a birth center, um, which is a big change for me that I made in August. Um, I was also a nurse first, practicing nurse. I was step down nurse. I practiced as an LND nurse for about a year and four years as a step down nurse. I was also a forensic nurse and then did midwifery school amongst all of that. And now I've been a practicing midwife for four years um, and most of that in the hospital until this August. And now I'm at a birth center up in New York practicing. Um, and that's what I know. I think my nursing experience certainly was super valuable um, ah, that's a great question. What is a step down nurse? So step down from the ICU or intermediate care unit. So kind of you have your general med surge floors, you have your intensive care units or ICUs, and then like in the middle is a step down or an intermediate care unit. So people who are either getting sicker and might end up at the ICU or who are in the ICU and are getting better and are kind of not quite ready for that general med surge. And we did do like cardiac monitoring on the floor. We did some drips. So it's kind of this place that's a little more complex than the general floor, not quite as intense as the ICU. I will say that the biggest difference in an intermediate care floor, at least from what I saw, is the patient ratio. Technically, mm -hmm. I mean, the biggest thing is patient acuity, um, but it's kind of a gray area. I wish they would do more research on this actually of what kind of defines intermediate care versus med surge care because a lot of patients end up in med surge and this is probably one of the things that makes it one of the harder places to be um is because you, you have a ratio of five to six patients and sometimes like they're really sick and they probably could be in the intermediate care floor but technically there's not any criteria that makes them meet that so for my floor especially which was heavily surgical a lot of patients would come to us with lots of drips and drains and, and all these things. Um, and I would still have five of them, but it wasn't until that the patient required an insulin drip or a cardiac drip that they, we had to step them up because that requires more frequent monitoring, like Q1, Q2 hours, which we physically wouldn't be able to do with five patients. But yet things like a heparin drip and lidocaine and ketamine, I, like, I would have patients on all three of them at one time. So acuity wise, it definitely varies. But um, I used to pick up overtime on Mary's floor because I enjoyed it because I had less patients. <laughs> yeah, the, the ratio for me was three to four patients. Um, and the nice thing was charge usually was not assigned patients unless of course there was a staffing shortage somewhere, but um, that was kind of a nice thing too. So that, that definitely- depends on the hospital. Yeah, it really does. And the criteria for being in the step down versus the ICU versus the med surge floors. There's some things that are fairly universal. Like if you're intubated, you're going to be in the ICU, but there are some things that are very specific to each hospital and their policies for sure. Oh, cool. So um, another Mary asked, how is the birth center different than a regular L&D unit? That's a great question. 
So really a birth center, I'm working at a freestanding birth center, meaning we are not attached to a hospital. Um, we are what they call CABC accredited. It's the Centers for Accreditation of Birth Centers, which means we have to be within a certain mile radius of a hospital. And I'm in New York City, so we're close to a bunch of hospitals. Um, and it means that it's a lower risk population. So we're not doing continuous monitoring of the baby, which does typically happen on a labor and delivery unit for most patients. We also though don't offer epidural for pain management. We can't do C-sections here. Um, and so because of that, you know, we have to have really strict risk criteria. So like someone that's a type one diabetic isn't gonna be delivering with us multiples. So twins or triplets are not gonna be delivering here with us. Um, so it's, it's a lower risk population, but we also don't have the same staff support as a hospital does. So like right now we have a laboring patient and it's me um, and my birth assistant who's an RN and a student midwife um, as well. So she is, um, she's here with me and that's kind of us. And we had like three patients at one point today and it was still just the two of us. Whereas on an L&D unit, you'll be staffed with nurses and residents if it's a teaching hospital and obstetricians. Um, and so staffing is a little different, but then, you know, the acuity of the patients are much different as well. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for answering all the questions and thanks for the questions. Let's continue on. Yuritsa, could you share more about uh, what brought you to your specialty? Hi, guys. My name is Yuritsa. Good to see you, Dawn and Angela from last year. <laughs> um, so I went to college up in Connecticut and uh, actually started at Georgetown in the operating room in their new grad program back in 2017. And um, recently this fall, I transitioned to the surgical ICU, which is, as all of you med surge step down, ICU nurses know, is a humongous jump. <laughs> um, definitely very, very different um, Operating room, I'll just talk a little bit about that first, is kind of a nursing specialty that not very many nurses get to experience, um, but it was something that I really did enjoy, but just wanted to make sure that if I did decide to go back to school or if I wanted to change career plans that I would be um, well-rounded. So I thought what better way to do that than to go to the surgical ICU because we do a lot of the surgeries down in the OR. And I know when we send them to the ICU, there's certain criteria that they meet. So I kind of had an idea of, oh, like this patient may have, you know, had a cardiac arrest in the OR. So instead of them going straight to PACU or going to a step-down unit, they may go straight up to the ICU. So I kind of had an idea of what kind of patients. So I work on C41 um, at Georgetown, which is our surgical ICU. So we get pretty much all of the liver transplants. Occasionally we'll get flaps. Um, we'll get kidney transplant patients. Um, we had one the other day in particular because he had a hypertensive crisis episode and um, also went hypoglycemic in the PACU. So it was great because I was like, oh, I understand why he's coming up to us. Um, I think the biggest thing that I was looking for was kind of like a new challenge and to expand my uh, learning abilities. And, and I started in October and here we are in February. I just got off orientation and I have learned so much in these past couple months. Like it surprises me how much I've learned. They do have, um, being that Georgetown is a teaching hospital, they have like courses associated with each floor. So I took the ECHO course, um, which is like a critical care course and they kind of helped prep you to learn different things like listening for different um, cardiac sounds or listening to different lung sounds and understanding the medications that I was going to be administering. So uh, if you're interested in learning tons, you could probably go to med surge, but if you're interested in a little bit of a higher acuity with less patients, it's typically a one-to-one -one if you have a very sick patient or um, two-to-one, so two patients, one nurse. And then if the step-down units are full and they're all intermediate care patients, then I may have three intermediate care patients, but usually a one-to-one -one or two-to-one staffing ratio. It's funny because Mary worked on C41, but the old C41, because when COVID hit, Georgetown created a couple more ICUs. So Mary's old C41 unit that stepped down thoracics moved up to C62. And so now this brand new ICU C41 is where they needed staff. So that's very cool that you're there. Yep. So... Here I am, but I still uh, moonlight in the OR. That is like my happy home. <laughs> um, so 
definitely you guys can do anything you put your mind to. If you're interested in something, I say go for it. I know it's kind of hard to do shadowing right now with COVID, but uh, definitely always email, apply. If you have any questions about either one, just let me know. Hello, everyone. My name is Minho. I actually graduated from Georgetown, the CNL program in 2017. And since the graduation, I did my new grad program at GW Oncology Unit for one year. And, but I've always wanted the emergency department even before I started the nursing program. Cause I, you know, when you watch TV or in the movie, you always see the emergency department where every like, crazy happens. And that's what drives me into nursing of like being in a fast pace and figuring things out, not know like you will see so many different diverse patient groups there from pediatric from to the geriatric but any and any kind of illnesses and that's the kind of uh, nursing care that i've always wanted to be in so during my uh, last year semester for the practicum i was actually had a chance to do at georgetown ed so and i've seen so many different patient group and i've learned what it's like in the emergency department. So I was like, I'm gonna go into emergency department. But like what everyone says, experience a medical surgical unit at least one year kind of have some good message background, what helpful. So I decided to do that at GW and which is very helpful. And then now I'm working at the Virginia Hospital Center emergency department. And I've been there for two years in like 20 days. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everybody for your introductions. That's great. Um, let's go to the next question. What does a day in the life look like for you? I know you would say you kind of got into that a little bit and how do you treat patients in comparison to other specialties? But you know, really what does the day-to-day -day look like and, and any examples would be great. So the children's NICU is a level four NICU. So that means we have, um, we get babies from outside hospitals if they're too sick for them to handle um, and we can support um, ECMO and other surgical interventions that other hospitals can't get. So when I come to work, we either do two to ones or three to ones. Um, so we either have two sicker babies or three healthier babies, depending on their acuity. Um, and what's specific about working in the NICU is that we have to treat them developmentally appropriately based on their age. So we can have preemies as young as 22 weeks and we can get them, um, the chronic kids can be as old as one year before we transfer them to the PICU. So if it's like a very young preemie, they're 22 weeks, our goal is to touch them as least as possible, to give them as least stimulation as possible. We wanna really mimic the womb and prevent stress. Um, say if they're around full term, then we try to cluster their cares around their feeding time. And if like they're an older chronic baby, we really wanna help promote their developmental um, milestones. So we might spend extra time and play with them and do some tummy time to help them build some strength. Um, so you can really have a big variety of different patients, even though it is specifically NICU. Um, but what I like about NICU is that some days you can have some healthy kids. They're just learning how to feed and grow and you sit down and feed them. And then other days you things change really quickly. You can have an emergency bedside surgery. You can deploy your kid onto ECMO. You might have to change your assignment entirely and just pick up, admit a new kid flying in on the helicopter. Um, so it definitely keeps me on my toes. Um, and then also how it compares to other specialties is babies don't talk. Um, you definitely have to communicate with the parents and be a team with the parents in order to um, educate the parents and advocate for the babies. Let me see, there was a question. Um, yes, so we can support um, 22 weekers with advanced life support that we have now. So technology has advanced and we can have really young babies. When did that change? Um, I don't know the exact time when it changed, but I like Mary updates me on all my women's health needs. <laughs> um, 
currently I have a consistent baby or I'm a primary nurse for a baby and she was X22 weaker. Wow. Yeah. She, I mean, she has a lot of comorbidities, but she's doing great otherwise. Are we still going to alphabetical order? I guess, oh, it's Mary's turn now. Mary, comment on the 22 week thing. Um, that is, I think, probably in the last, I want to say, two or three-ish years, but it really depends on the level of NICU, too. Not every level NICU can handle 22 weeks, so that's probably still rarer unless you get to the higher level NICUs like Emily's, um, as far as what people, you know, what NICU units can support that young of a gestational age, for sure. Um, a day in the life for me um, can look really different. Some days I'm just in the office seeing patients prenatally and doing some GYN care. So like PAPs, birth control, all of that great stuff. Today I'm on call. So I was literally answering phone calls. So patient questions that come in on the emergency line and then evaluating people for labor um, and ultimately admitting a patient. Um, I have 24 hours our shifts, which are really rough. Babies often are not born during nice times in the middle of the day or early evening. They like to be born in the middle of the night or 3 or 4 a.m. more typically than not. Um, and labor can be long. Um, and we're here to support our birthing patients as much as we possibly can. So, um, you know, a day can be very different. And I guess too, just from like the LND nurse perspective, like on LND, you have your 12 hour shifts, but you can have like quite a few births even as an LND nurse within that 12 hour shift. Like often if you have um, an active patient, you'll be like, you know, one-to-one, -one, but really two-to-one because you're monitoring baby, you're monitoring mom, but it depends again on the unit and what else is going on. You can have much more than just the one dyad for sure. Um, so again, a day um, in the life of a CRNA or nurse anesthetist um, starts at the hospital around 6.30 a.m. Um, I get my room assignment. So um, I may be doing anything from pediatrics to geriatrics. I may be in the main operating room for scheduled surgeries. Um, I may be up on labor and delivery, um, taking care of mamas that need C-sections or managing epidurals. Um, we also, we provide anesthesia for anybody that needs it. So sometimes the CT or MRI patients need anesthesia. Um, sometimes we're called down to the ER for a trauma code. Um, we are also the code team for the hospital. So we, re, uh, respond to all the codes on the floors as well. We also run, um, a very busy GI unit. So I may be doing endoscopies and colonoscopies for the day. So that kind of keeps it fun for me. Um, so I come in in the morning and I find out where I'm going to be. And then I go to set up my room. So that includes an anesthesia machine check, um, an airway setup, emergency equipment available, my pharmacology setup, all the medications that I'll use that day. Um, and then I'll go and see my patient. I'll do a chart review and then I'll do a pre-op assessment on the patient. And then um, depending on the state that you work in, depends on if you are medically directed or not. In the state of Virginia, we are medically directed. So I do work under an anesthesiologist. So similar to some NPs or midwives, you may work under a physician. So we work together as a team and discuss the anesthetic plan for the patient. Uh, that may be a general anesthetic. It may be a sedation case. It may be a block. We might do a nerve block, an epidural or a spinal. Um, whatever the patient you know, is best suited for, uh, we'll make a decision as far as what we think is the safest anesthetic for that patient. Um, then I'll see the patient and I will be with them from the start of the anesthetic to the end of the anesthetic and then transport the patient to PACU or ICU and then hand off care there. Um, I make my own decisions as far as the anesthetic, uh, what airway device I wanna place and how I place it. Invasive lines that need to be placed are placed by me. Um, it depends again, what hospital you work at and what your, um, your credential to do in some hospitals, you will place epidurals, spinals, nerve blocks, things like that. It kind of just depends. Um, the rest of my day is, I'm trying to look at my notes. Um, that's pretty much it. Like once I, 
once I transfer care to the next care team, pack your ICU, and then I go on to my next surgery. So I may have a really long surgery for the day, like a 12 hour surgery, and that's all I do all day. Or I may have several very quick eye surgeries and I take care of 12 patients in a day. So um, that again, keeps me on my toes and keeps it interesting. And in the way that my career is very different from other specialties is I'm very specialized. So I really focus on really only patients that need anesthesia. And I only take care of one patient at a time. So that patient is mine until their anesthetic is over and until they're safe enough to hand off care. And the way that I work together with the physician is also very unique um, in our team approach to um, safely administer an anesthetic to a patient. And that again can differ from hospital and it can also differ from state to state. So it is different across the board on that. John, we have a quick question. Do you experience problems with patients asking for an anesthesiologist instead? We do run into that occasionally. And often it's because the patient is not educated to what a nurse anesthetist is and what our training level is. So at Virginia Hospital Center with a group that I work with, Dominion Anesthesia, we first educate the patient and we help them to understand that we are a care team model and that we use nurse anesthetists and we educate them on our level of expertise. Typically, once we do that, the patient then understands what or who is going to be taking care of them and they are then agreeable to that. There are some patients that refuse altogether. And unless it's a situation where the patient's there that day, most of the time these patients are calling in ahead of time, then we, we kindly suggest that they have their surgery done at a facility that only uses anesthesiologists. Great, Angela, can you go next? Or Angelica, sorry. This happens all the time. Um, so being a med surge nurse is like, I would say nursing in its rawest form. What I liked so much about it was the variety. I would go into work and have like no clue what I was getting into. And as a new nurse, it's scary. Um, but as you get more comfortable, you realize how much you learn as you go. So sure, there's going to be patients that are not the best, but then there's going to be some that you just connect with on such a deeper level. Um, and the acuity can range and the, the like why they're there they can, can change. So I took care of a lot of surgical patients and it was awesome to like admit them from surgery and watch them progress and then discharge them and never see them again, which was great. Whether we had a lot of patients also that, you know, it was surgical oncology, they had cancer, they would get it removed and they would complications come back and you get to know them. Um, and so that's, why I like bedside nursing because you really develop an intimate relationship with patients. Um, there's many I even like stayed in touch with, ones that have stayed in the hospital for so long and you know you really just get a lot of gratitude from them. Um, there are also some that even we kind of hospiced in on our unit but that was more so previously um, hospice has come a long way and we try and get patients out of the hospital. COVID has been very interesting in the med surge world, not having visitors. Part of it's been really nice because it's like less people to work around and deal with, but for the geriatric population, for example, it's actually been really difficult because, you know, delirium, huge problem. Oftentimes familiar environments, family members can help reorient them and also for safety. Like as a med surge nurse, you're really, really busy. And I, I thrived off that. That's why I loved that. I, I can't sit still, clearly. Uh, <laughs> So juggling five to six patients or even like having five patients, having one or two discharged, readmitting, it was always something. Um, but for those patients that do need kind of a closer eye, it was really helpful to have family members that can make sure they're not jumping out of bed. And so we can avoid restraints and things like that. Um, I mean, I can go on about the older adult population, but if you do anything besides peds, NICU, you're definitely going to see a lot of them. Fun fact, all of the baby boomers will be over age 65 by the year 2030. So they're very up and coming. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't really know much about this. So the, and the infusion nurses seem to have a cool job. They work, you know, Monday through Friday and they do what they do. And it's really awesome. Um, I'm just glad I had like a lot of years at the bedside in med surge to kind of see like 
everything that happens from the good, the bad, the ugly, the, the codes, the, the treatments, um, the medications, the procedures, everything. So if you don't really know what you want to do, then med surge is the place for you. I guess the, the downside to that is, is that you are really, really busy and there's days that are really hard and hard to prioritize and hard to juggle. Um, and then I, I often wish like, oh, if only I had two patients, like that would be so great. Like sometimes I wished I did do a little stint in critical care. Um, Cause once I got more knowledgeable, I wanted to like focus more. And then I realized that with five or six patients, I couldn't focus as much on them as I wanted to. Um, so there's always work to be done. But I never take it back. And even those who think they, what I always say, that's okay. It's fine. Love med search. Rock on. We're going to talk about what you all enjoy least. So you've already hit on that a bit. Uh, Yuritza. Hi. Um, I think what I enjoy least right now from the ICU standpoint is um, sometimes it's like very difficult when you have patients who are what we call like crumping or, you know, nearing the end of their life. And right now, you know, Georgetown has a zero visitor policy. And uh, if you're, if the patient is an eminent death, then we have to get special permission and their family members can come and visit. However, it's only two people and they're only allowed to visit for, I think it's four hours. So I had a, a mid 30 year old female who was from California and out here for work. And she was her cancer was getting the best of her. And so we were trying to work with her and her family to get her family out here to see her in time. And so I think probably I, I can relate it to only to COVID right now because I started in the middle of COVID in the middle of a pandemic. So I think for me, that's probably my least favorite thing um, is when you're in the ICU, patients either get better and they get stepped down or they unfortunately, you know, pass away and they leave us. And so I think that's the hardest part for me is when they are very sick and they may not necessarily get to make peace with their family and say goodbye, which was very different for me in the OR because um, kind of like Dawn was saying, you take care of that patient until they go over to PACU or to the ICU. And so for me, I know that we handed them off in a good standing and I think that they're going to be okay. So um, I think it's just hard for me to separate that and be like, you know, this happens, it's a thing. And they always say you have to kind of have like your, your nursing self and then your you self and kind of be able to separate yourself from the, the patient in the situation. So I think that's probably my least favorite thing right now, being that I started in the middle of a pandemic, that's probably one of the few things I can speak to at the moment. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, Min Ho, if you could share just what the day in the life looks like for emergency, but also for oncology, since you worked in that, and then cover also what's your least favorite aspect. I'm going to circle back to the other three panelists who haven't answered that question. For the ED, it's really hard to predict what your schedule or what your work is going to be like, because Sometimes you only have, like you walk into the unit and you only have a three patient in the entire unit. And sometimes you have like a 30 people in a waiting room constantly just like waiting to be seen by a doctor. So it's really hard to predict. And you also get some patients, like it really depends on the patient's group because some patients comes in with uh, little operations and or you might getting some patient that who is having like active heart attacks or a stroke. So it's always in high stress and you always have to be ready. So I guess, and even though like you con like continuous discharging patients or transferring patients to other units, like you will get the next patient right away. So pretty much you don't really have a time to have a little bit of like resetting or taking a little break. But that's also the fun part of the, the ED nursing where you always have a patient, you will have a new patients every single time. So Let's say if you had the, like when I was an oncology unit, there are times when I enjoyed having this one, or like I had about four or five patients per shift. And then if I signed up my schedule three days in a row, then I know I will get those same patients for three days in a row. And I will know so much about the patients and 
I build better connection with the patients. But there are some times where some patients are extremely difficult and you want to switch it, but you can't because you're in the unit <laughs> with that's your schedule and that's what they give to you. But in the ED, if you have the patients who are very difficult, you know by next day, they're not gonna be there. You can mm -hmm. always opt out. You don't mm -hmm. have to take care of a difficult patient. Don't be afraid of them. I liked the challenge personally, when I had a really difficult one, I'd make it a challenge to like bond with them so that I would handle them again. Probably in my eight years, I'd only refused to take back maybe four patients. Got fired a couple times too, but it happened. Gotta, gotta hold your ground in the med search world. Yeah, <laughs> but I think I prefer the way I see as many patients I can per shift. So like, like I think now I see about at least 40 to 50 patients a day because because I do a lot more of a, like a flow nurses and I also, there are like different roles in the ED. So like there are chances where, and I also do express care nurse, which means it's a like urgent care setup in the emergency department. So we see like 40 to 50 patients in the like 12 hour shift per nurse. <laughs> so that's the fun part. And like I said, there are so many different uh, roles in the emergency department. So like every unit has a charge nurse, but we also have flow nurse, tri triage nurse, trauma nurse, express care nurse, and a radi like a radiology safety nurse. So you're not in just gonna do the same patient care you're going to do so many different like types of patient cares that you might not do in other units. So you will like have a like a very good time like developing like a new skill set. And for oncology, it's I've only been there for one year and it was during the new grad so I can't really tell much about it. <laughs> other than it was very similar to mass search cuz they at the GW they always had a very like over, like message overflow patients in there. <laughs> Thank you, Minho. We do have a quick question for you. What is your typical patient ratio in emergency? So every ED is different, but the, at BHC we do something called team nursing. So team nursing is like the entire ED is divided into a four zone, and each zone there are two nurses and one technician. And then each zone take care of between 12 and 13 patients. So you usually have like maybe six or seven, depends on the patient acuity. So like one nurse might take care of a higher acuity patients and less number of patients, or you might have an easier acuity. So you take more patients. So, and also if we have a patient that were coming in with like trauma or like MI or stroke, then they will focus on that one patient while the other nurse is taking care of everyone else. That way you're not like a behind when you finish with those like the trauma, trauma or any kind of high acuity like patients. So I'll say between like a 12 and 13, but you're with another nurse. So, and they know that we're working together. So it's very, it goes pretty smoothly, even though there's a high number. <laughs> All right, thank you, Minho. Um, so let's see, Emily, Mary, and Don, if you could answer the question, Emily, yeah, you first. Uh, what is your least favorite aspect of your specialty? So my least favorite aspect of working in the NICU is definitely some ethical issues that we have. Um, obviously, babies aren't their own medical decision makers. Um, and sometimes the parents and the care team can have different understandings of the baby's health and um, outcomes. Um, so parents might delay or refuse necessary treatments, which can be frustrating to watch for the babies. Um, for example, one situation I'm currently dealing with, I'm a primary nurse for that 22 weeker. She's now about four months old, corrected to full term-ish. Um, dad's totally not involved and then mom is very young and she almost never calls never visits she can't afford a cell phone plan so our team can't contact her and we can't get consent for a lot of necessary medical um procedures we have to do um so ethically it makes me a little bit uncomfortable knowing this 
child will be going home at one point with lots of follow-up care necessary and maybe even a trach and G-tube. Um, so it's definitely something that we had to get social work and CPS involved with. Um, but there's a lot of like ethical things with the parents that make me a little bit frustrated sometimes. And you really have to advocate for your patients, which are the babies. So. Mary, you go next. So, I mean, really as a midwife, you know, hospital midwifery versus out of hospital midwifery presents like very different scenarios. I mean, like in hospital, but even like when you're caring for people prenatally, like there's loss, there's miscarriage. Um, there's people who really don't want to be pregnant that end up pregnant, but feel like they can't, you know, have a termination or that's not available. Um, so I feel like it's like that typical, like it always looks like sunshine and roses and you think like, oh, you're like cuddling babies and supporting moms, but it, it's not always that way. And even I think one of the more difficult things in out of hospital birth is that like this is the birth a patient really like sought out, desires, desperately wants. And sometimes those plans change, birth is completely unpredictable. And because we are not a hospital, like you know, if there's something that even seems a little bit wrong, it might not feel so major to the patient, but it could have major complications. And that like, you know, being like, yeah, like you have to transfer to the hospital is sometimes one of the worst things you can tell a patient or it feels like. Um, and even though, you know, their baby goes on to have okay outcomes and they might even have a vaginal delivery, it's just, you know, it wasn't the right or safest place to happen outside of a hospital setting. And you know, some patients can be really hurt or bitter or even traumatized when things don't go the way that they really hope. So I think that would be, those are the things that are a bit hard. Um, so my least favorite aspect of my job um, is kind of the opposite um, for the other specialties is I don't really get to know my patients very well. Um, and I'm a little bit used to my patients not talking to me from working in critical care and being intubated, um, but I did get to know them. I spent a lot of time with them. I got to know their families and I got to know my patients through their families. Uh, with anesthesia, I don't have family at the bedside. Um, I only have that patient and they're not talking to me. If they're talking to me, that's normally a problem. Um, and my patients typically do not remember me. If they remember me, then that also means there was probably a problem. Um, however, I do see it as a little bit of a challenge um, in the fact that I do get to know my patients for five to 15 minutes prior to their anesthetic. And I like to use that five to 15 minutes um, very wisely in order to try to find out something about my patient I can relate to. Um, have a lot of empathy for them and what they're going through. A lot of people come into surgery very anxious and a lot of their anxiety is related to anesthesia. Um, so I do, I do really sort of find that as my like golden five minutes that I get with my patient. And I do find that a challenge, um, but a joyful challenge. Um, handing off my patient sometimes in um, difficult um, scenarios or unstable circumstances is very difficult as well because often I don't know how that patient did. Um, it takes a lot of searching and asking uh, because, you know, these days you're not supposed to go back through charts and all of this. So a lot of times I don't know the outcome of my patients and that is difficult. I think about those patients a lot and I never forget them. Um, and I just wish that I could know a little bit more. Thank you everybody for your just really candid responses. I really appreciate that and really different. So it's really helpful to hear that. Um, let's do a quick, quick one piece of advice you'd give for the students. So like one sentence, um, we'll start with Emily. If you have one piece of advice you would share with students, what would that be? So starting a new job in nursing, like a fresh grad, there's a big learning curve and it can be overwhelming. And I know all of you Georgetown students are very high achieving, but know that you are very well prepared. You have all the critical thinking skills necessary and you are going to be a great nurse.
Perfect. Mary, can you go next? Sure. So kind of coming off of what Emily said, it's a lot of it is a little bit of the fake it till you make it. And I don't mean to do anything unsafe if you don't really know, but it's kind of that like confidence going in, like maybe it's your first IV, but the patient doesn't necessarily have to know, like, this is the first time I'm doing an IV on a real patient. That's not my nursing school friend or whatever, or my preceptor. Um, it's, you know, going in and just having that confidence and knowing that your education set you up to be in the right place, but also having the confidence to say to your preceptor or to who you're working with, like, hey, like this is a little above my head and I need some help here too sometimes. So it's that balance. My piece of advice is to shadow, 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 and ask questions. Get interested, put your foot indoors, don't sit back and wait for it to come to you. If you think you're interested in something, then put forth the effort to find out if that's what it is that makes you happy and you can see yourself doing every day. Um, there are many doors that I put my foot into that I later took back out um, because I realized that was not for me. Um, and then once you put your foot in that right door, then you'll know that's your place. And your place may change over the years and that's okay. And that's what's so great about nursing is that you can continue to change, to be challenged and be uh, rewarded in different ways. So if anybody ever wants to shadow, let me know, we'll get you in there. One sentence, Jody. come on. <laughs> my, my my biggest, um, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions ever. The no question is a stupid question. Nurses can be stressed out and there's gonna be some that don't seem as approachable, like it's gonna happen. Um, but as peers, we would much prefer you to go in and ask the question than assume you know, and then do something stupid or unsafe. Um, don't, like never be afraid. I mean, even as a quote, expert level nurse, like I would still check with cohort, hey, what would you do in this situation? Like I've never, I haven't done this in a long time, that kind of thing. Cause like teamwork really is the way to go. And okay, med surge might not be for everyone, but if you don't know what you like, it's a great opportunity to find out and just be open. Like, so sure you may be in nursing school right now and think, oh my God, I only want to take care of babies, but like, maybe you don't maybe you would fall in love with oncology or something else. But also, I think it's important the, the basis of med surge, not to push it so much, but you, if you start in the NICU or if you start in PEDS or psych, like you won't know anything else. And your first year out of nursing school is your most important time of learning. You'll learn more in that first year than you did all throughout nursing school. Um, but the great thing about nursing is that there's so many opportunities you can always change. And like my other best friend that's not Mary is, is a psych nurse and she did an accelerated program and I told her to go to med surge also. And she was very adamant that like psych was it for her and she's very happy and she loves psych. And so that's awesome. But just know that if you do start in a specialty like that, it may be difficult if you do change your mind. So be open and ask questions. Um, well, you guys kind of like hit the nail on the head with ask questions, be adventurous. Um, I think probably what my biggest thing will be is to don't forget to take care of yourself because you cannot pour from an empty cup. Um, like whether it be working out or, you know, reading a book or taking time to see your family, whatever it is, especially, I mean, I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm not really from the area. I'm from the shore. So making sure, you know, prior to COVID, taking time out to go see my family and taking a mental health day if you need it. It's so important. It Your brain functions better when you're not you know, wicked stressed out and you are going to be a better nurse to your patients when you're not in such a, you know, messy headspace. So I think that's my biggest thing is don't forget to have fun. You are young, you're graduating school, congratulations and um, take care of yourself. I guess my biggest advice will be don't really worry so much about what specialty you want to go into because 
you can decide that once you're going to like become a nurse, like, and then you can experience so many different like the specialties and then decide later, see truly what you really like. So just focus on like just the skills and the knowledge that you'll get from the nursing school. And then, yeah, just like what everyone said, like enjoy, like what you like just, and then always like take care of yourself Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so for those of you who moved, we have a question. What was the most difficult part about moving from one specialty to another? So think about that, but we have a couple more concrete questions for Mary. So Mary, are there externships or volunteer opportunities available at the birth center? Also, what would you recommend a new graduate nurse do if they intend to become a midwife, L&D first, straight to grad school? So a couple of quick questions for you before we get to the transition question. Sure. So um, as far as um, birth center experiences, we do, we have um, a volunteer doula and VA program. We are trying to get more people in. COVID has kind of limited that a bit too, um, but definitely um, I will make sure that I have my contact information there. So certainly I am working at Brooklyn Birthing Center. I know most of you guys, I think are probably in the DMV area, um, but I am happy to connect with anyone and talk about my experience, of course. And as far as someone wanting to become a midwife, so I was unique in that I kind of found midwifery and knew I wanted to be a nurse midwife before I was a nurse. I had a different bachelor's degree and I did do an accelerated RN program, but before I went to grad school, I did practice as a nurse, like I said earlier, and I think that was really important is to get more generic experience because those skills really, and it's just learning to be a nurse, like learning to trust your gut, to recognize a pattern, to even like, you know, the simple stuff, like to start an IV, to insert a Foley, like those are all still skills that I use all the time and being proficient at them is important, but also just like the, the nursing gut, so to speak, learning to trust that because kind of you know, not everything is completely black and white and needing to recognize something is going wrong well ahead of time, especially now when I'm not in the hospital is really important and could actually like save the mom or save a baby's life. So I do really, I'm one of those people who feels pretty strongly about getting the more general experience first, but I will say L&D is not for everybody. I know that Angelica tells me all the time that she like could never do what I do. It's very much like a love of hate kind of a specialty world. Um, but I still, I really appreciate the experience I had going in um, into L&D before just going straight for the specialty. Great, thank you. So for those of you who um, did transition from one specialty to the other, would you mind sharing what was the most difficult part about that transition? I can't really think of any difficult part about switching the specialty. It's because when you go into the, when I went from the oncology to emergency department, you have to go through the orientation again at the new specialty, going through like the new skill sets and then like the way you take care of the patients and the schedules and everything you will pretty much learn from the beginning, from the basic again. So like they will build you up to fit you into that unit when the specialty. So I really don't see any big difficulty in the switching. It's more about just your willingness to switch. <laughs> uh, wow, Minho, I wish I could have had your, uh, your switch. I um, definitely had difficulty. The operative world hospital except maybe labor and delivery infections but I didn't I had some I'm supposed to be coming and and the ICU uh, we to come up with like a swan or it's like a huge line that they put in their neck and it's a chemodynamic monitoring line so learning about that and um, remembering how to put in a an 
IVs. I can do a raw hands. I'm transitioning from an expert nurse in my field going back down to novice nurse, I think was very difficult for me, but I'm so glad that I took the plunge. I have been learning so much and now I understand what happens. I say like before and after the curtain. So in the operating room, there's like a curtain that goes up that Dawn is behind when she's doing her anesthesia. And now I kind of know what happens afterwards as well when, if they go to the ICU and they need intensive care monitoring. So I just, for me, I think it was definitely um, the whole, just learning everything. It was kind of like being back in nursing school for me again. I kept my notes. I pulled out some of my med surge notes and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't remember you know, what an S3 heart sound might sound like. So uh, I think that was it for me, just redeveloping my basic nursing skills because in the operating room, the skill set that you develop is completely different and the skill set that you use is completely different, which is great. And it made me a great OR nurse. However, all around other nursing specialties, I was... <laughs> I totally agree with the mindset of, it's really hard to go from being like an expert in what you're doing to back to the novice again. And I, I procrastinated on that for quite some time, like, cause I consider it in between med surge, like, Oh, what if I did do a stint in ICU? I mean, a, it was too hard to do school full time and work full time. And then if I had to take the ECMO class, that's just, that's a whole learning curve in and of itself. So it wouldn't be plausible. But when I started nurse practitioner clinicals, that was really hard. I mean, that was my, where I was a novice. I was like, I don't know how to order medications. Like, you know, I'm at the point where sure I'm an expert level at what I do here and I can question any doctor's order happily. But when you're the one that has to make those decisions, it's a totally new learning curve. And I know, so nurse practitioner is a very common thing that a lot of young people want to do, but especially with the NPs, definitely get nursing experience first because you will really not ha have a clue. I mean, not to call people incompetent, but like you, you don't ha have a, a clue of like how to take care of patients. And the experience I do have as a bedside nurse makes me that much better of an advanced practicing provider because I can see the patient as a whole. Like I'll never lose my nursing experience. And anyone that is a nurse and has practiced as a nurse will kind of have that bond of like, you know, doctors don't really understand. And, um, it's just, it's exciting to kind of, I feel like a little bit of both now because I'm working directly with this oncologist and I want to like make his practice better and for patients and he is just the most brilliant human and it's going to teach me so much. And that's like the difference between medical school and nursing school. It's a different way of learning. So I wish that in practice and healthcare interdisciplinary communication would be better because nurses and doctors are both essential. So um being, being the new kid on the block was hard again, and now being an NP, I feel better only because I'm coming from MedStar to MedStar and having the knowledge I do, but I definitely need to like step back and absorb a lot of what's going on. So that's that. I definitely cried a lot too, leaving my seven bless Georgetown. Very sad. <laughs> I think that's everybody who's transitioned, right? And so I think that's, that is the end of the program. I just want to thank you all for taking time tonight to talk with you all for your questions. It looks like a few of the panelists have put in their emails um, if you have any further questions. But you know, thank you for what you all do as nurses and thank you for helping us with this panel and sharing about your specialty and your insight. We really appreciate it. So virtual, virtual clap to all of you from all the students and myself. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night.